from Coliseum Home Videos, it's the Wrestling Perspective. <laughs> hey, I'm Dennis Farrell. That's Lars Fredrickson. What's up, Lars? Just another day, buddy. Sunday. It's a beautiful day. Well, uh, woke up at 1030 because of the hour, the, the time change thing. I'm, I, and then I was curious, uh, why the fuck do we do this? Why the fuck do we do daylight savings? I mean, I, it I seems know. like it's some French shit from like 300 years ago. Like, why are we? I, I don't get it. But anyway, I digress. Well, listen, Dennis, how are you? I'm good, man. And guess what? From punk rock to murder hawk. Listen, I've been practicing that one all day. I'm proud of myself. It's Lance Archer. Lance, thank you so much for joining us. What's up, guys? Hey, my one clever for the month. I'm 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 out now, guys. I'm gonna sit back no, and let you two talk. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. That was a good one. Thank you. Listen, uh <laughs> AEW, we're excited to have you here. A lot of exciting things going on in your life. And I'm glad that you made some time on this. We're going to give it away. It's pre-recorded. It's a Sunday. You made time yeah. for us. We're <laughs> excited. Thank you. No problem. I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, that, that time change got me too because I was in Indianapolis and had to catch wow. a 740 a.m. flight. And <laughs> at, at, at like 1245, I was at a friend's comedy show. And I'm like, oh, crap, there's an hour. It's, I'm losing an hour. <laughs> Like even less time to sleep. It was just like it was a crazy morning. Uh, yeah, I bet. Well, I, I'm going to throw out my my first question here, and it was one I had kind of buried in my notes, and I was going to wait till the end of the show to bring it up. But with what happened to Big E recently, and you kind of going through the same thing, I really right. wanted to ask you about the mental aspect of this. We all know athletes who, you know, they say it's not really rehabbing from the knee injury; it's that first step or the first cut after an MCL. For for a guy like you going through it, what was the mental part of coming back from that injury? Yeah, first off, for Big E, man, I, I hope for a speedy recovery on the guy. I was literally there on his first day of training at FCW way back in the day. Uh, super good dude from the very beginning to, you know, and everybody that seems to know him and love him, you know, he's, we're all hoping he has a speedy recovery. Um, his seems to be a little more severe than mine. I, I got lucky and was blessed beyond blessing because I didn't actually break my neck. Um, you know, the MRIs that I got were all clean. I didn't have any, you know, damage to the spinal cord, no breaks, no nothing like that. I just ultimately had like severe trauma to the muscles through my neck and into my back. You know, it was basically like having a severe whiplash situation on, on my part. Um, so for him, you know, luckily, like I said, he has cracked vertebrae, but nothing that requires surgery from what he said, um, which is an amazing thing. Um, but it's, it's a long process and it's just kind of that mental aspect of, going all right you know, it, it, like for me even now like I'm I think I'm as recovered as I'm going to ever be but my body kind of still protects itself like I, somebody will say something and I'm like hey Lance and instead of just turning my head and looking at them I'll do the big the whole body turn you know and it's <laughs> I don't even really need to do it just my body is still kind of in that you know protect yourself lock down and make sure you don't hurt yourself mode and so I think for him you know coming back from this that's going to be you know, as you're getting range of motion, you know, our training staff at AEW, uh, Bryce, one of our trainers, like he would torture me, but what he was really doing was helping me uh, advance so quickly in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do by myself just with my own rehab or even with, you know, like a regular place that does rehab because like he's very specific with sports rehab. Um, and like I said, for Big E, I think that's going to be the big thing, you know, once his cracked vertebrae heal so that he can start his own rehab. Um, is getting that range of motion and again trusting your body to move he's such a thick muscular dude you know he's going to have to get that uh, again I keep saying range of motion but that's the biggest aspect to it I think so well you know one of the questions that's interesting and you know I hope you get get well better uh, soon and uh, obviously shouts to Big East as well but yeah did you feel do you feel like not working so much in the pandemic maybe contributed to a lot of these kind of injuries that we're seeing happen because I know for me as a musician, you know, having two years off and then trying to go up there and, you know, two an hour and a half, I was like, uh, uh where's the oxygen tank. But, you know, like I just noticed the, the physical toll just on me by not doing it, you know, cause I, I feel like the more and more that I, that I use the, the muscles in my voice or my hands or whatever, the easier it is to do every night. But do you, do you think that played a factor in, in, in what's going on? 
Yeah, no, I totally understand what you're trying to say because I think anybody, like you said, that, that when you when you're doing what you do and you do it on a consistent basis, you kind of you 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 gain that that uh, muscle memory that is there. But when it kind of goes away, you have to get back to it. You know, we uh, professional wrestling AEW, we were one of the only sports or things that never stopped. You know, right. we took maybe we took maybe a month month and a half something like that off because we filmed a bunch of stuff in Atlanta way back in uh was it march of 2020 because we just didn't know we were going to get to go back and then you know florida was very open and so you know because we're our home base was in jacksonville we started going to jacksonville and we were you know it was empty arena uh wrestling which was such a weird and odd experience um and shout out to all the extras that that played our audience because that helped out tremendously um but we never really stopped so the, I can't, the difference between, I think what you're talking about and what we dealt with was a little bit different because again, we didn't stop, but to what you are saying. So, you know, I came from Japan, uh, but what, before I signed with AEW and new Japan, especially at that time was their company was growing. It was booming. You know, and I'd go over there for a, a 21 day tour and we would do 18 shows in 21 days. Right. So it was every single night wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Well, then I, come over to AEW, you know, we're flying out there. And at the time we were doing, you know, two days of taping and whatnot. You might wrestle one time, maybe two times in those two days. That was a huge difference because it went from, like I said, going for three weeks in Japan and wrestling 18 of the 21 days to maybe wrestling once or twice every other week. So that aspect, I actually see what you're saying and what you're talking about. One of my dogs is going crazy. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not. Um, it's trending out but, my cat. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've got him locked in the room because we're, we're getting something fixed at the house. Anyway, uh, but yeah, yeah, that 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 muscle memory and, and not doing it as often. I do remember, you know, again, I was wrestling so much in Japan and I don't remember hurting as much as when I would wrestle one time or two times every other taping. And I think it was kind of because we were going so hard in that moment, in that time that we got to wrestle. And again, your body is kind of relaxed from not doing anything. Uh, it, it almost seemed to hurt more sometimes than when I was wrestling yeah. 18 out of 21 days. I well, that was to my point. I'm sorry, Dennis, but that was to my point because, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're consistently taking bumps seven days, five days out of the seven days a week, right? You know, like yeah. a lot of guys, you know, before the, the shutdown. So I was just kind of curious. It's like, you know, sometimes the muscles kind of get tighter and stiffer. You're not, you know, the fascia and moving. And that, yeah, so thanks for answering that question for us. Dennis, for I'm sure. sorry. And I'm no spring chicken, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I've listened to probably no less than five hours of Lance Archer interviews today. Really wanting. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> I was excited. This is this was on our bucket list of interviews. So the fact that you were like number one right out the bat, it made Lars and I super excited. And you talk about a lot of stuff we'll touch on, but the one thing I never really heard you talk about was. Did you have a love for wrestling before you got into it? Did they have to, I, I know you were a bouncer and then you, you went to training. Did they have to talk you into it? Were you excited? What was your mindset towards the industry as an outsider, like kind of Lars and I are? Yeah. I mean, classic story, you know, bouncer to strip club and uh, became a pro wrestler. Um, but, you know, I was going to school. I, I played football. That was my big passion in high school and college. You know, I really wanted to play ball. Um, I became a pro wrestling fan, like around, I didn't, I didn't grow up on it. Like a lot of guys, you hear a lot of guys, say, oh, I was, you know, when I was eight years old, I remember going to wherever and seeing whoever at, you know, this place. And it was the, it's what made me fall in love with pro wrestling. And I, I didn't have that. Um, I didn't start watching wrestling until I want to say I was like a, a sophomore in high school. Um, you know, and I, I was a big WCW mark. I was, you know, watching WCW and Sting, you know, people ask, you know, who, who was kind of the, the wrestler, the talent that got you into the business. And Sting was that guy for me. He, he donned the crow persona and I'd seen that movie and really loved the movie and, you know, the whole mentality of that. And when he donned that persona and was up in the rafters, and, you know, just, you know, week after week after week, he just didn't know where he was going to be. And he never said a word, but he was so, you know, encapsulating of, of, of everything and everybody um and that got my attention so I became a huge wrestling fan and like even when I was in uh college you know we would have our Monday night wrestling watching nights and you know I was playing football and that's what I wanted to do but again we were big pro wrestling fans and, you know I'm I'm old enough but we don't have to mention that that we were we were having to 
put in our VHS tapes and tape one of the shows so we could watch it later. And uh, so the Monday Night Wars were real back then. And it was a lot of fun. And I fell in love with wrestling then as a fan. But again, my passion and my direction was supposed to be pro football. That was where I was going. So follow up question, Lars. Did you meet Sting before he joined AEW before? And did you mark out when you met him? Because I'm, I'm a Sting guy myself. I'm a WCW NWA right. guy. And I like I'm eight or nine when I met him the first time at center stage in Atlanta, Georgia. And it, it, our, I guess that's my question there. I'll wrap it up there. Yeah, no, I, so I, I've been very lucky in my, in my career professional wrestling, you know, I, I've done it, uh, July will be 22 years for me. Um, and you know, only about the first four, four and a half years were spent on just the independence in Texas. Um, and then I got signed on with the, it's now impact wrestling, but it was TNA wrestling back then. And he joined TNA and actually, you know, he came in and did a few spot shots and actually got to film be a part of one of the, the little movies he made. I can't remember the title of the movie, but it was kind of about his life and his faith and things like that. And, you know, we got to do a scene where it was kind of like a dream sequence scene and he's in a ring and, you know, everybody's up on these corners and whatnot. I got to hit him with a chair and I was like, I can retire right now. I got to hit Sting with a chair, you know, it was, <laughs> for me, it was just the coolest thing, you know, and he was nothing but cool. Um, you know, I do remember a few times, you know, after he did sign on full time with TNA and, you know, I didn't know where my, that career was going as far as TNA was concerned or the business of wrestling was concerned. And there was a moment when I had to have a, you know, a real heart to heart with myself and kind of trying to decide what I wanted to do in the business. And, you know, I reached out to him and he actually called me and we talked about it and he gave me a lot of thoughts and advice. And, you know, they always say, you know, not always, but they try to say, sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes because they'll disappoint you. Um, he's never, never disappointed. He's always been a good, genuine dude. He's always willing to give advice and talk to you if he's got the time. Um, he's, you know, never, ever big time to me or anybody I've ever heard that he's, you know, treated that way. Um, so it's been absolutely cool from, like I said, from the TNA days, and now getting to work with him again at AEW. I'd hope for it. I'd, I'd ask for a match back in TNA with him. Uh, it didn't happen. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, at some point before he retires, you know, maybe I'll be his retirement match and, you know, you know, everybody dies. So murder hawk monster takes out sting, you know, who knows? Well, I want to talk a little bit about Japan because I was fortunate enough to, you know, spend considerable amount of time and see a lot of pro wrestling over there from 2005 to about 2015. Mm -hmm. And I've, I saw you at the G1 uh, tags when you were with Suzuki. And then I also mm -hmm. saw you in, in pro wrestling Noah. Mm -hmm. And my, I was always curious because I've never really asked this question, but how did you find the two companies different? I mean, you know, it seems like you were, you were always put into tag, tag teams and even mm -hmm. in your, your impact or TNA run, you know, the rock and rave thing. Yeah. But I'm, I'm always, I was always kind of curious, like, you know, you put, you're put in a tag situation with Suzuki and then you obviously your, your tag partner, you know, his dad was obviously, you know, anyways, but. My point is, is that why did you always seem to find yourself in, the, in these tag team situations? Or was it something that you wanted to do? Or was it something that th that's, that's the ideas that they had for you? It was just the ideas they had for me. I mean, I, you know, all, all the way through TNA, you know, I, I teamed with uh, Ron Truth Killings. And we had a fun team. The, the Truth Hoyts was the, the yeah. kind of the, the Don name, you know, and then teaming with, uh, you know, I started with Kid Cash at TNA. That's you know, right. We were a team. And then, like I said, then me and Truth worked together. And then, um, well, was it wasn't, you know, I'm sorry to, to cut you off, but no, did you're something good. happened with Kid Cash. And then, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, we don't have to get in the dirt, you know, or whatever, but I feel like that kind of sidelined you a little bit. And if you want to elaborate, please do. If you don't want to elaborate, that's totally fine. Oh, no, no, no. I, you know, <laughs> Kid Cash is, he was, he was great for me, you know, and I think we kicked it off really well because I was a young, hungry kid. Um, I shut my mouth and opened my ears and he helped me out tremendously. Uh, we had a good tag team. It worked the dynamic, you know, it was always kind of that, that Shawn Michaels diesel gimmick. You know, he was obviously the Shawn in the situation. I was the diesel in the situation and it always has kind of worked in pro wrestling. So we were working well as a team together. And again, I just wanted to learn and get better. Cash is very well known. <laughs> for being a little bit of a hothead, um, you know, and, and he's, he's very vocal when he wants to be vocal, when he feels that he's, you know, he's very passionate about his, his situation and his positions and, and what's going on in his career and so on and so forth. And, you know, sometimes I wish I could be a little more kid cashish, uh, maybe not as abrasive as he was sometimes, but 
you know, he, he very much voiced his opinion on his situation several times. And, you know, there was a couple of times where they kind of separated us and had him doing his own thing. And I just kind of would disappear. And then I came back and we teamed together again for a little while. And then he said and did some very silly stuff and got himself released from the company. And all of a sudden I was by myself again. And like I said, then that kind of pushed towards the Ron Truth Killings uh, team. And then ultimately, um, Vince Russo was kind of uh, one of the bookers and, you know, he was a big fan of Jimmy Rave and he was bringing Jimmy in and he just, he was like, Hey, I'm going to team you and Jimmy Rave together. You know, I didn't know anything really about Jimmy. I knew that he'd done a lot of ring of honor and, and had done really well there. Um, but we were very different, you know, in our styles and looks and whatnot. And so um, we got the rock and rave gimmick thrown on us. And as a true musician, what did you think of stuff like that? The rock and rave. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, you always, you're, you're always hoping that they don't, they don't get it right to a certain extent because then it's not, <laughs> then it's no longer entertainment value. You know what I mean? Right. If it's too real, then you realize it's freaking boring. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like everybody wants to get into the backstage until they get back there. And we're all talking about, you know you know the newspaper or whatever you know what i mean <laughs> it's not what it it seems to be but i mean honestly i've always liked like the musician gimmicks i always liked the honky tonk man and the rock and rave and the and, and you know the rap is crap and the you know the, the whole thing like you know kurt hanning was so genius with that yeah. and you know so to me when that when it touched always touched on the musical thing or our, our van hammer i mean that was yeah. that was I mean, but that's, there's something fun about that. Like, I, I remember I had a friend of mine in the tape traders and I said, just get me every Van Hammer match you possibly can. Cause I just want to sit there <laughs> and laugh. Cause I mean, you know, you, this is what I'm talking about, about your career though, because you wrestle in Japan where it's very strong style. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're knocking the shit out of each other. Then you do this kind of more comedic kind of side, this thing right here and your character, and this is something I want to get into later, but your character is, is, has developed and matured over time. And I don't know if we want to just jump in that right now, but um, I want to know, like, how did you keep, you know, you, 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 you I feel like you've been throwing a lot of obstacles and you've always <laughs> overcome them. Right. Right. And your character has matured and now you're this monster. Right? right that i feel like you always were but it was like very tumultuous for you to finally get there so and then now you're in a company who sort of celebrates that creative freedom and it gives you the ball to run with it and right. you did you know so um how did you sort of keep moving that character forward even with all the obstacles yeah i mean it, it, it's one of those things like sometimes especially in wrestling you know we're talking about the rock and rave infection and that was just literally thrown on us like me, Jimmy, and, and Christy had been teaming together, but we didn't have any direction. We didn't have any real character. We were just each other. And they literally threw it on us one day. You know, he showed up and Glenn Gilberti, Disco Inferno, was like, hey, do you guys hear what you're doing? And we're like, no, what are we doing? And they're like, oh, well, so you guys think you're a real rock band, but you only play Guitar <laughs> Hero. And, you know, we were like, oh, you're trying to murder our careers. Okay. But then they were like, yeah, you're on all three tapings. You have live mic time. You have backstage segment stuff. And we're like, okay, this is more than we've ever got to do, do before. So we're going to try to capitalize on a, the best way we can. So we just had fun with it. It was very tongue in cheek. You know, I, I didn't drink hardly at all, but I always talked about having the fifth whiskey and stuff back then. <laughs> you know a cigarette in my mouth and i didn't even smoke and, you know. that well, i will say that was the most unnatural oh yeah it was horrible. you can you, you can tell when somebody has never held a cigarette because they hold it like real dainty oh, yeah. like a, you know like like uh, like back in the 20s like oh professor you know what i mean like yeah. it's like that's what you had but yes. well, that was part of the comedic yeah. you know that's that's another side of your persona that you know yeah to you know, make and, my and, point and that was what it was. And then I did my, my short, <clears throat> my short stint up North. Um, and that didn't go very great. They chopped my hair off. Like I, I, my great story is like, so I had like long hair down my back at the braided goatee, big biker jacket and everything. And I got brought up to TV and then like Vince and Johnny Ace who were in charge at the time were kind of looking at me in the ring one, at one moment, like five minutes before the doors open. And uh, Johnny was like, dude, come here. He's like, what's up, Johnny? He's like, we're cutting your hair. I was like, I'm on TV still tonight? And he goes, yeah. 
And I was like, all right, that's cool. Let's do it. You know, and you just, you have to go with the flow. And like, literally they chopped my hair off, shaved my face, yanked the jacket off of me, turned me into big guy number three. Yeah. But I had to do what I had to do. You know, and again, my, my stint there was not very good. And it was, it was over pretty quick. Um, and then I got lucky and got to go to Japan. And you're talking about, I guess, maybe how did I find myself? And Japan was a really big proponent in helping me find who I always should have been being that monster. You know, I, I think it's what the business wanted of me. I just didn't know how to portray it. So other things were thrown at me and I just kind of deal with them at the time. And when I went to Japan, you know, Japan's very well known for its, its big gaijin. They're, they're big foreigners, you know, the Vaders and the Stan Hansons and uh, the Bruger Brodies. And you mean the- Terry that Gordy's, Dr. Yeah, Death, you know. That list goes on and on. And they love when they're just big and brutish and, you know, the Japanese people can't understand a word they're saying. And they're just, they want you, you know, Stan Hansen would literally go through the crowd with a cowbell and hit people with and stuff like that. Um, that's where kind of the advancement of the murder hot monster came from. I was going kind of by the moniker, the, the American psycho when I first started in Japan, but they were really good about, they were just basically be like, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. But more big, more strong, more monster. And they would say that all the time, more monster. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'll give you more monster. So like every time I went out there and then going back to the working 18 times out of 21 days i had time after time you know rep after rep you know it's like being in the studio and playing the same song i would imagine over and over and over you figure out how to play it exactly right. like you want it and how you need it and want it to sound because it starts off one way and probably comes out a complete different way by the time you're done with it and that was kind of my uh path with becoming the murder hawk monster and you know, uh, fast forward, you know, you're talking about the teams that I dealt with, uh, me and Davey Boy Smith Jr., Harry Smith, we teamed for like six years, 2012 mm -hmm. till 2019, almost seven years. Yeah. You know, uh, three-time IWGP tag champs, two-time NOAA GHC tag champs, two-time NWA tag champs. We had a really successful, badass, the Killer Elite Squad was an amazing tag team. Um, and that one kind of came about because uh, Gato, who's the booker of New Japan, you know, I've been there for about a year and they'd been wanting to bring Harry in. Um, so they finally decided to, and he was like, Hey, I'm going to put you guys together. These two big ass guys in, and you're just going to wreck shop. And that's what we did. They brought us in, they put us together. And within a month of the team forming, we were the IWGP tag team champions. You know, you beat Tenzan and Kojima, two of the most legendary yeah. Japanese professional wrestlers ever. Um, so it established us as a team and that was just kind of what I was put in, you know, most of my career, like I said, are all these tag teams, which has been great. You know, Kurt Hawkins and I had a good tag team in WWE, even though it didn't really get to go anywhere. Um, so I've just kind of been associated with tag teams all my career. And then fast forward to 2019 and Harry decided he was not going to work with New Japan anymore. And um, they put me in the G1 Climax. I've been in it several times before, but was just always kind of a food for fodder type guy. You know, I was just there to have matches. They knew what they thought they knew of me. Um, and then in 2019, I, I got to have a match with Will Ospreay in their New Japan Cup. And they were blown away because they didn't know I could work that way. And I was like, well, you guys have never really given me that, that opportunity or that position. You know, I've been in these tag team matches for the last seven years and you know every other match is a 10-man tag it's like i'm not going to go have those kind of matches yeah. like i can with will osprey in a single situation so then the g1 came around and i wasn't even originally supposed to be in the g1 but they were um they were doing it in dallas which was the first time the g1 had ever been outside of japan um mm -hmm. so they were really pushing for a big thing and then somebody somewhere decided to put me in the full g1 tournament and they paired me up with uh, Osprey in, in, in Dallas. We were literally the first G1 match ever to happen outside of Japan, you know, on foreign soil in Dallas, Texas, in front of my own home crowd. And again, you know, I, we'd already kind of set a bar from the New Japan Cup, and then we were able to blow that bar out of the, out of the bar, um, you know, because Will's amazing. Like, he's, if you step in the ring and have a bad match with Will, there's something really wrong with you, but you know, everybody knew how good he was and me being able to play my style, my, that was really the birth of the murder hawk monster. Cause I changed my hair and my image and just kind of how I came to the ring and the mentality and everything. And um, I, that advancement, like I said, kind of started in 2011 when I got on with New Japan. And like I said, they were just like more big, more strong, more monster. And then over the 
almost nine years I was there, I was able to kind of develop that mentality and understand who I always should have been in the business of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. And then now getting to come to AEW, like you said, the creative freedom, you know, initially, you know, the, the first video that we put out with Jake and I, and, you know, it was really cool in the backyard and beating everybody up and stuff like that. And then the backstage stuff, throwing the guy in the ceiling and, you know, people throwing in trash cans and all kinds of crazy shit. It was just, it was a lot of fun. And like, that's been the great part about AEW is having that creative freedom. Like if I come up with a fun idea for something in backstage area, if I get it done, you know, a lot of times they'll put it on TV. It's, it's, it's a, been a fun experience for sure. Well, you know, I'm sorry, Dennis, but I need to piggyback off this question because I, you know, watching your career over the years, it mm -hmm. kind of took me by surprise to, to a little bit to put you with Jake. Okay. You know what I mean? Because you guys are, are sort of similar in stature, you right. know? And uh, I, I know Jake is, is like, he's one of my favorite all-time wrestlers, but yeah. I want to know how you felt about it because I felt like a little bit like with all of your success and all mm. that you've done in the world of professional wrestling and American fans are so much smarter yeah. than let's say 20 years ago when we were tape trading, you know, in order for us to get, we'd either have to be physically in Japan to see the matches Otherwise, we were trading with somebody to get the matches, right? right? Obviously, that doesn't even apply anymore because of the internet and New Japan. You know, you know. Obviously, there's been an, an American, you know, sort of uh, an acceptance, and I mm -hmm. feel like even crowds, yeah, as so, somewhat act. But how did you feel about being put with Jake? Was it something that, like, you were like, okay, well, this, I guess, I'll have to roll with this now, or was it something like, fuck yeah, Jake the Snake Roberts, let's do this. I can, I know, I can learn so much more. Like, what was your take on it? Yeah, you know, so initially, like, it, it was kind of talked to me, you know, I, I, I didn't know that that was even a thought at first. Um, and then I, I came to one of the TV tapings they were doing in Austin. I was signed with the company, but I hadn't debuted yet. And it was, you know, a, a couple of different people were brought up and Jake was the one that I felt matched the most with me, you know, just physically and, and style and things like that. And I understood it, you know, like you said, the fans are a lot smarter and we did have a lot of fans that knew the New Japan product, but AEW was still an American product, a Western product. And there were a lot of fans that hadn't watched New Japan. And I had been out of the American wrestling scene for like nearly nine years. And even when I first started, like people were like, oh, is that the dude from Rock and Rave from TNA? <laughs> like that's how, that's how far back they, they were thinking. They're like, oh my God, that was, you know, 12, 15 years ago, whatever it was when that happened. And so they hadn't seen me. They didn't know me. They didn't know this version of me. And Jake was, like you said, he's a legend. He's somebody that everybody knows and can associate with one way or another generationally. And he can talk like no other. Um, you know, and I, I, I like to believe that I can cut a pretty decent promo and I've gotten a lot better at it. But that was never my strong suit. My strong suit was being that intimidating force in the ring. Jake was a guy that could cut that promo and tell your story without even doing anything physically. Um, he's that legend, people know him and people are paying attention to him. So when Jake first appeared and he's like, I've got a client, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, who's the client? Who, who's with Jake the Snake Roberts? You know, and there was a little bit of a buzz of different, you know, people that they thought it might be. And, you know, some people thought it was me, some people thought it was different guys. And when I came out, you know, uh, it was kind of a big surprise. They had announced that I was with the company. And so now people are going, oh, well, maybe it's Lance, maybe it's Lance. Those people knew who I was, but there were a lot of people that didn't know who I was. And so Jake helped that transition. And I knew that and understood that. Um, it's one of those things like you're always wanting to prove yourself by yourself. But at the same time, I understood the importance of having somebody like Jake the Snake Roberts who can voice who the Murder Hawk monster is to a new audience that doesn't know me, doesn't know anything about me, what I've been doing in Japan or whatever. And if the few people that do remember me are going, oh, that's the rock and rave guy. Well, now Jake can help explain the no. I mean, that that's the same human being, but it's not the same person at all. Um, and I understood the importance of having somebody like Jake Snake Roberts with me and helping me. And, and you know, and like I said, he's helped me tremendously because people ask this all the time, you know, what has Jake done the most for me, you know, in our time together? And um, it, it's being able to speak. It's being able to voice who I am and what I want to say in a very good and strong way. You know, I was used to the Japanese, like we would do a match in Japan. And after the match, you know, they would just, they'd have the cameras there. It was much more like, uh, like 
sports where, you know, they had the, the post game interview type scenario and that's what it was. So you'd have a match and you'd come down and it was just rah, 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 I'm the murder hog monster and everybody died, ah, you know, just very loud and very strong. And they loved that because it scared the shit out of all the Japanese. Um, <laughs> and like, I would, so I got, uh, do we have time for a fun story? We have plenty we of got, time. Yes. Okay, cool. So bad luck followed, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah. Okay. So bad luck folly and I became good friends. Um, there was, he, 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 so he learned Japanese because he played professional rugby in Japan for like 11 years before oh, wow. he got into professional wrestling. Um, so now he's in professional wrestling. And when I first showed up in new Japan, you know, he was still what they call a young lion. Uh, but he kind of was the guy that helped translate for us a lot of times, you know, it's like, if, if we needed to talk to somebody there, hey, folly, come here, tell, you know, tell us what Lance needs. And, or I'd go, hey, Folly, please ask them, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so like, they didn't like us using Japanese. You know, they wanted us to be, you know, foreigners and they wanted us to yell and scream. They didn't want anybody to understand us. But like, I was like, man, I really wanted to be able to say something in Japanese. So I was like, Folly, I was like, you know, I'm like, after all my promos, I'm like, I'm, I'm the American psycho. I'm the one you should be afraid of. That's what I say. I was like, well, how do I, how do I tell people like in Japanese, be afraid of me? He's like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, he goes, okay, now you you have to get in the you got to get in the camera, and this is my best folly impersonation. So folly, if you're hearing this, this is you, brother. Um, so he was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he said, what do I what do I think of this? Sorry, my dogs are going nuts. <laughs> Hold on, no problem. Just don't don't don't. Dave don't, LaGreca don't, kill my dogs. don't worry don't, I won't. don't Dave LaGreca us <laughs> no um so anyway so he's like yeah you gotta go you gotta say or do you go this I said uh okay and if there's any Japanese they're gonna be like oh <laughs> and so I was like okay okay I'll practice it I'll practice it and then I never did it in front of the camera but so like one night like me and Fale and a few guys we went out to Rapungi, and if you know you know Rapungi, it's it's a you can get kind of crazy you know we're coming back in a taxi and he's like, hey, hey, he's like, practice now. I'm like, practice? He's like, yeah, say it to the taxi driver. So, you know, you get, he's like, okay, what is it again? He's like, what do you watch Inko this? So, but he's like, you're going to say it. So, okay. I said, hey, hey, what do you watch Inko this? <laughs> taxi driver looks, he, he's just driving. He goes, he laughs. I look at Fale and Fale is like, oh, you're more strong, man. More. <laughs> okay. So, hey. Yeah, what do you want this? And he goes, <laughs> I'm just like, what's going on? He says, like, no, no, you did good, you did good. <laughs> so the next day we're at his show and uh Tiger Mask, who speaks pretty good English, I was like, hey Tiger Mask. He's like, what's that? I was like, uh, if I said to you, what do you want cinco this? What do you say? And he goes, Why do you say that? <laughs> and I go, What did I say? He goes, he goes, you are dick. <laughs> And I went, what? <laughs> and I looked down and Folly's just, he's on the ground rolling laughing. He's, he had me telling this taxi driver, I was a dick. He's like, hey, taxi driver, I'm a dick. I'm a dick. <laughs> and he was, he was trying to get me to say that on camera. And thank <laughs> God I never said it. Like, I'm the American psycho. Or you like Shane They didn't like, what the? No, you're done, dude. And I was like, you son of a bitch. He, he got me. I, I want to oh. circle back. By the way, okay. part of the show here, and you've <laughs> you, all right, Jinsaki. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you you've mentioned on several interviews uh, early in your career um, here in America, it's no, 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 no. You go to Japan, it's yes, 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 and it helps you grow. Now you come back over with AEW. Before you sign, when you're coming back over, do you have that in the back of your head of here we go again? Everything I've learned, I maybe get stunted and I'm going back on the no train? No, because I didn't give a damn. Okay. I, I was at this point in my career with the confidence in myself. Uh, I knew what I had in the Murder Hawk Monster and if I heard no, I would have told people to kiss my ass. Um, you know, and as far as how I wrestled and things like this, like, you know, they were getting a guy who'd been wrestling at that point, you know, uh, it's been two, a little over two years. So, so almost 20 years of wrestling at that point um, and nearly nine years in Japan. So I knew myself, I knew what to do. I knew how to do it. I needed to learn like, you know, Western style a little bit again, because I hadn't been over here as much. You know, I'd worked the independence and stuff like that. 
Um, I was going back on a TV market, a live TV market, which is always an interesting change of events, you know, learning timing and stuff in comparison to, to Japanese wrestling, because we're not on the clock as hard as you are when you're on live TV here in the States. Um, but yeah, if it had ever, ever been one of those things like where there, somebody's telling me, no, don't do that. I'd have been like, kiss my ass. This is what I do. This is how I do it. And I do it very well. And you're not going to tell me no. And so as far as that's concerned, no, I wasn't worried about that at all. Like I said, learning to speak is a whole new game. But again, I have Jake the Snake Roberts right there at my side who's helping me learn how to voice the Murder Hawk monster uh, for an American audience on American TV. Um, and so it was never like, even he's not like, no, don't do that. He's like, oh, maybe, but try it this way. He's mm -hmm. like, there's nothing wrong with what you did. Just try it this way. And I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, but yeah, no, I was never worried about them telling me, no, don't do that. No, don't do this. Because I'd have been like, well, kiss my ass. I'm going to do it anyway. And if you can stop me, then you can stop me from doing it. Which there's very few guys in our company or the business as a whole that can stop me. <laughs> Lars, you have the last question, then we're going to wrap up the show with our new accidental game we found out with Jeff, Jeff Cobb last week. Lars? <laughs> oh, wait. I'm, oh, I get a question now? I, I, thought, I thought you were looking for your time to shine because you felt left it. out. I'm done. Sorry, Dennis. Sorry, Dennis. We didn't kick you the ball. Okay. <laughs> Last you know, I, I, game. Listen, I I, I want to go for another hour with this guy because, you know, I, I got you know, man. I'm, All right. Go hurry on my, my thought, because, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the short stint. Yes, it was a cup of coffee with the Voodoo Murders, which I still own my T-shirt. Um, you know, my <laughs> there you go. But it's kind of like a transitional phase for you at that mm -hmm. point, because it's kind of like, well, I'm coming home from Japan and doing this. So so where are you at in your mind at that point? And, and I, I know that I'm asking you to go back some years here, no, you're but good. it's like, because I kind of feel like this is the part of your story and, and correct me if I'm wrong, where it's kind of like, you don't really know which way place to where you're going to land. And I'm just, I want to know what's kind of going through your head because you're sort of, you know, no matter where you're going, you're being shoved into a tag team, whatever it is. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where are you at at, the, at that moment? Because like, like I said, it was a very brief stint, but yet you were part of it and it's a big faction. Right. Uh, you know, so so I've been I was with TNA still at the time um, and we did have some freedom to go work third party bookings. TNA wasn't booking me a whole lot. Um, I'd gotten on with a, a small independent company in Japan. Uh, originally, it was called Makahan and then it was turned into big, big Van Vader, Vader Time Wrestling. when Vader was actually involved and Vader got me and another guy, uh, uh, an Oklahoma wrestler who Vader had been bringing out to Japan. Um, on a tour with All Japan, and this was early 2009. Um, and it was one of those interesting situations where the other guy, his name was Michael Faith, and unfortunately Michael Faith has passed away, so, you know, uh, rest his soul. Um, Mike was being promoted as the main guy, the star, because he was Vader's guy. I wasn't. I was the, the money man's guy before Vader got involved with this independent company. But so my, the money guy wanted me, his name was Asso, Mr. Asso or Asso son. He wanted me on this tour and Vader wanted Mike. But Vader's, you know, Vader, Vader's the legend, especially in Japan. So all Japan was listening to Vader as to who the, the star of the, the group was. And it was, it was Mike, you know, because they even came to me one time. They're like, ah, you know, don't, don't mind if they're not paying as much attention to you. You know, you just go do you and they'll see what you're worth. And I was like, all right, great. So we go and do this small tour. It was like five shows over about two weeks. Uh, we were included into the Voodoo Murders. Um, and that was kind of my real, my first real, because I'd done a few shows in Japan, but they were very small. So this was my first involvement with a bigger company. You know, uh, Suzuki was there. Um, uh, Kojima was, uh, I think Kojima was the Triple Crown or maybe Suzuki was Triple Crown champion at the time, but they were both there. And, um, Sorry, people are being loud. If y'all can hear them, I apologize. It's all right. uh, <laughs> That's fine. Anyway, so um, yeah, they were. That was our first, my first real involvement in Japanese wrestling as a whole. And we started the tour, and like I said, there was more focus on Mike and what he was doing. But by the end of the tour, uh, the last show, they actually pulled me aside by myself, and they're like, "Hey, do you want to come back?" And I was like, "Hell yeah!" Muda liked me; he wanted me there. Um, and, you know, but that was right after that was when I got signed on with WWE. So that kind of right. 
pick, took that out. But otherwise, I was going to be going back and still being a part of Voodoo Murders. Joe Dory, wow. who's, you know, with Impact Wrestling now, he was yeah. a part of Voodoo Murders. Yeah. And basically, Joe and I were going to uh, share time. Like, he'd be there one tour, I'd be there another tour. And we were going to be the two big gaijin of Voodoo Murders. Um, and so that was my first real learning of Japanese wrestling. Like I said, I've been there a few times before on the it's very small independent level, but this was my first time working actually like Cork and Hall um, and going to Kyoto. There's a really cool uh, building in Kyoto that has like, it's a huge mural, which is, it's interestingly, oddly, it looks like a church mural. It's actually like the creation story, but done in like stained glass. I don't know why it's there. I don't think it's a church or anything like that, but it's just this huge stained glass mural. And you'll see a lot of the smaller companies. Noah used it a lot. New Japan, when I first got there, would use it. Um, and like, it's a really cool building because you got this huge stained glass background while you're wrestling and whatnot. And uh, so it was my first time getting to go to all these places and working with Voodoo Murders. And um, it was a really cool experience. And it was kind of my first, all right, be a monster scenario. And that was when I really started learning. And so... And I actually got the phone call. Uh, I got an email saying that I needed to talk to Terry Taylor. Um, and so I old school Skyped him with a headset on and stuff like that uh, from my laptop. And he was like, oh, where are you at? And I was like, I'm in Japan. And he's like, oh, you're, you're still there? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, ah. And I was like, you guys wanting to release me or something? And he goes, ah. <laughs> And it was a very interesting moment. He's like, yeah, well, unfortunately, you know, and he goes in this big spiel and he's like, the company is doing this off the wagon challenge. We'd like you to come in and do this. And I was like, that's fine. I was like, I'll get a last payday. I'll get to actually see some of my friends for maybe one last time in TNA. Uh, but I did have this conversation while I was in the middle of a, a tour in Japan for all Japan working with Voodoo Murders. Wow. All right. Well, I'm not going to end the show now because you've, said you've got time and now I've got another question. And Go for it. You, you talk a lot about how, you know, your careers had peaks and valleys. I've listened to other mm -hmm. interviews where you talk about going to school, but you learned a lot from uh, Shawn Michaels students all over the yes. place on the road. At what point in your career do you feel like you put it all together? Like mm. not, not so much you know what made you you but what made you comfortable in the ring what made you say all right i, I figured this thing out it, it took me a long time man i mean i again you know talking about you're asking about the no no no's and stuff like that and that's for a young guy who's trying to find himself and you know going from tna and then working some stuff in japan to going to wwe and like you're just constantly like people uh, all these different people have kind of a different envisionment of who they think you should be. Right. So you're constantly getting somebody telling you to do it this way. And another guy telling you to do it this way. You know, that was the problem I had in WWE is like, I'd have one of the, our producers, one of the legends telling me, man, you should, you should be this way. And then I would do it that way. And one of the other legends would see it and go, ah, why did you do that? I don't really like that. And you can't really say, well, so-and-so told me to do that because now right. you're like throwing people under the bus and you never want to do that. I mean, some people will, but I was never that guy. So I would just be like, ah, you know, it was something I was trying to do. I would never throw anyone under the bus. Um, it, it really took me being in New Japan. Like I said, I, I go back to that all the time, the more big, more strong, more monster. Because I always heard that, it helped me find who I should be. And I think that's when it kind of really clicked, you know, the American psycho and working with Smith as the tag team and being in Suzuki goon. And, you know, they did a really good job. We knew what our job was when you're a foreigner going over to Japan, you know, that your job is to go over there, get over big and then put over the Japanese boys. I mean, that's, that's the basic simple job. It's a very basic, simple formula. It's worked forever and it still works today. Um, but they did a great job. Like, like uh, there would be times when I'd be working matches with Suzuki and whatnot, and I would just go away and disappear because they would put the whole match together. And then I'd come back. And, you know, a lot of times, like if you're not there and heavily involved with the creative process in a match, you'll get left out. Whereas there in Japan, like Suzuki took really good care of me and made sure he's like, here's what we're doing in the match, but here's your moment. You go and you do this here, then there. And it was like more big, more strong, more monster. It was always, it was never a kind of, all right, your big ass disappear into the background. It was always like, if you're coming in, make a statement. And he always made sure that we had a moment to make our statement. Um, you know, so, so that was what helped me figure out who I would be. And I, you ask, when did I figure it out? I mean, we're always still learning. Hell, I'm still learning today. But 
I think I figured out who I needed to be somewhere in the middle of my run with New Japan because I figured out who the American Psycho was. And then when I had the opportunity to work with Will and showed them that I could go in the ring, you know, like they didn't know I could do, but I knew I could do. Um, and then that's when I really knew who I should be. You know, it was like, all right, I know who I should be. But, you know, you're talking about worried about coming back to the States and hearing the no, no, no's again. At that point, I was like, no, I, I know who I am, who I should be, and who I'm going to be. And if you tell me no, I'll tell you, mm, sorry, kiss my ass. I'm going to keep doing this because I know this works. It just needs the platform to do it. Well, you know, one of the things that I find very interesting is that, you know, you're one of the guys that during this whole pandemic that this now huge company um, is relying on, you know, to be part of the show and, and to put asses in seats, to, it, so to speak, you know, um, or viewers onto the screen since there was no real asses in the seat. So, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, how, how, the, the, how the tide has changed a little bit for you. So now here we are, and like I, what I like to say is we're at another golden age of professional wrestling. And the way that we consume professional wrestling is completely different than, let's say, you know, 10 years ago, really. Um, For sure. Now you're finding yourself in probably, you know, there's, you know, one of the biggest companies in North America. Um, how do you feel about, like, the opportunities now that are given to the workers, the boys? You know, there's a lot of places where you can go and you can make a living. It doesn't have to be. I mean... And you were in the place where everybody used to want to go to make a, a living, to get right. you know that sort of notoriety, to, to carry on into the indies or into other promotions. Oh, he wrestled for this or whatever it is. But now it's more of like a, a territory in a way where, mm. you know, because you can go to New Japan, you can go to Impact, you can go to AEW, you can go to NWA, you can go to GCW, you can go to WWE. There's a lot more choices. How do you feel personally? Because, I mean, you've been doing this you know, probably half your life at this point, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, like because you're what, 44, 43, 44 years old? 32. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to discuss. Yeah, 32. We'll say 32. 32. Well, I'm, okay. <laughs> well, oh, then I'm 35. Then, okay. if that's if that's we're, we're going there. But um, you know, but you know, but how do you feel about like all the opportunity here that that's now for you guys? Right. Yeah. I mean, it. It unfortunately, the pandemic has slowed a lot of that down. Um, it's slowly starting to reopen back up. You know, guys are getting to go back to the UK some. Um, you know, we're really hoping because we have a really good relationship. Like when I signed on with AEW, AEW, one of the things that was agreed upon was that I would still, like Moxley, uh, if I had the opportunity and New Japan wanted to use me and it didn't conflict with the AEW schedule, I could go to Japan and work. But obviously the world shut down. And, and the Japanese are much more, you know, regimented. They're much more strict in how they do things. And they're right. more slowly opening back up. So one of the things that became extremely difficult with the possibility of going back to Japan uh, were if you didn't have a pre-existing visa, you couldn't get a new visa to go back over there. So before the pandemic, you, like you were just mentioning, there were so many open options. You could go and make a pretty good living on just working the independents and showing up here and there at other companies at different times. Um, when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, uh, you know, I, I got very lucky, very blessed to sign on with AEW when I did, because had I stayed with New Japan, like there'd have been, a lot of the guys didn't do anything for like six or seven months. And, you know, they were asked to take a little bit of a pay cut to help the company, which, you know, it is what you have to do to, to help the business continue to go. Um, but then even when the guys started going back over there, the ones that could go back over there, now they're being asked to go and do a two week quarantine before they even start anything. Right. And then being asked to stay for two, three, four, five months at a time, which is something we were never asked to do before. You know, I'd go in a day or two before the, show, the tour started, work a tour, which could consist of two to six weeks. And then I'd go home and then I'd come back and that wasn't an option anymore. So like, um, I'm real good friends with Chase Owens and he's over there a lot. He stays over there for months out of the time, you know, and I, he, man, he's that, that's a workhorse right there when you're doing stuff like that. Um, it's starting to open back up. It's starting to become more of an option. You know, AEW has been amazing. You know, I think Tony's extremely smart with the idea of working with all these companies. You know, we have a really good relationship with New Japan right now. Like when I first signed on, it was like, yeah, you can go to Japan and work, but you can't really do anything stateside with them. Well, now there's a really, really good relationship. You know, Moxley's going there, Eddie's going there, I've gone there. Um, and so the possibilities of working New Japan stuff 
on the U.S. side is open in there. And, and, you know, we obviously had and probably to some small degree still have a relationship with Impact Wrestling. Um, you know, ROH, now Tony owns ROH. So we own that part of the, the option that exists. And then, you know, I just, like I said, I flew in this morning from Indianapolis. I went and worked for a, a, an independent company called Warrior Wrestling and they ran a show last night in, in Indianapolis. And it was a great independent show. Um, had some of the top names. The top flight was on the show. Blue was on the show from AEW. Uh, Killer Cross was on the show, you know, who's, who's made a name for himself. A lot of guys, it's a top notch show. I, and I worked uh, Mike Bennett, you know, who works with ROH and, and now Impact, you know, so we had a killer match and it was a lot of fun with the fact that our guys and girls have the options to go do stuff like that. So not only are we being seen on AEW television, now the fans can like in Indianapolis and places like that can come to these uh, really good, high quality independent shows and they get to see us, you know, very up close and personal. And it's a lot of fun. And I think it just helps AEW be even bigger than it already is you know you said it's one of the biggest companies in north america it's becoming one of the biggest companies in the world you know we're broadcast in so many different places around the world with you know once it's an option that's open you know we will be going to the uk and if if canada becomes an option we will be going to canada and if japan becomes an option we will be going to japan you know so i think the world's starting to open back up i hope nothing <laughs> crazy goes and shuts it back down who knows uh, just seems to come in waves these days in different ways. Um, yeah. But yeah, if if that option keeps growing and opening, you know, it, it makes it so much more fun for all the guys and girls to get opportunities. And it's just going to make AEW a bigger, bigger deal with, you know, you never know who's going to show up where and when and who's going to show up on AED, AEW television. So for the fan base, they're constantly going, well, who's coming from where? What's going to happen? Who's, oh my God, so-and-so's here. Oh my God, so-and-so's here, you know, and so, stuff like that. And, I think that's, you talk about the new golden era of professional wrestling. I think that's what makes it fun. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to look at WWE. They just had, you know, uh, uh, Mickey James in the uh, Royal Rumble promoted, <laughs> promoted her as the Impact Women's Champion with her belt on, on WWE television at the Royal Rumble. I mean, <laughs> something that would unheard of, you know, in a, a year to do go even less than that. Um, so, but I think that makes it so fun for the, the wrestling fan base to, to never know who's going to show up, when, how, and where, and what's going to happen. All right, Lars, as much as we want to keep asking the questions, it's time to wrap it up with our favorite new game. All right. <laughs> we, Lars and myself, try to guess what you're watching on television lately. Okay. Now, so please tell me you watch TV. So you remember when the guy said, oh, yeah, this is not two kids in their parents' basement podcast? Well, this is where it becomes two kids in their parents' basement <laughs> podcast. So, so yep, uh, Lars and I, based on what we think we know about you, we'll throw right. out a TV show and you tell us if we're right or wrong. And at, what, right. we, what did we say? Three questions, three guesses, and whoever three had guesses. A, most answers. Are we, we talking? Are we talking strictly TV? Are we talking streaming services? What are we talking about? Streaming and TV. Okay. Yes. Okay. All, All right. right, Lars. I went first last game. You go first this time. I think that Lance Archer is Lance Hoyt or Lance whatever he is because he's been in many Lances in his life. He's a fan of The Walking Dead. I was. Mm. Well, what does that count? I mean, that's, I mean, I was. Are you currently watching you, Walking Dead? And guess dead? what? Once you, you were part of the Voodoo Murders, is that a point for me, Lance, or is that like half a point? I don't, I don't think we're, it we're is. We're going to go half a point because I'm not, I'm not half a point. To it. All right. All right. Half a point. Half a point. My guess, you being a Texas boy, Yellowstone. I've never watched Yellowstone. Oh, really? That was I a want, I, I wanted. I wanted to watch it, but I just haven't watched it. Oh. All right. So I'm going to guess that. Uh, so, okay. Well, can we can we can we uh, have a little question about like what? Let's just find out what his favorite streaming service is, and then we can get some hints. Right. What's your favorite streaming service, Lance? Currently, yeah. Paramount. Oh, okay, okay. I'm gonna say Lance uh, is a fan of Ozark. No. Oh, half a point, still in the lead, baby. <laughs> It's a tough one now. I feel some pressure coming on, Lance. Um, Paramount, though. I'm going to say, and I'm going to throw a curveball here and say Peacemaker. Nope. Well, that's that's HBO. 
It is, but I was say just HBO Max. To... Okay, I, I did, I did, I did watch HBO. I did. Oh, excuse yeah. me, I did watch Peacemaker. Yes. Half point what? is that? No, I don't know. He watched it. He didn't. He didn't put it over. Did you finish? Did you finish Peacemaker? Yes, I did finish Peacemaker, and then the final scene was the best one. Well, and don't that... tell me because I'm still watching oh, okay. Peacemaker. So okay. that's a half point for me. We're tied. Is that a half point? Okay, that so is. then we're gonna. Okay, I'll give it to finish you, Dennis, it, just because I, I feel sorry for you because of your personal. <laughs> All right. So, well, Paramount. I don't. I don't have that streaming service. So I. I I'm gonna. So. You want. You want a hint? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So, I'm gonna say, Lance is a fan of the Star Trek series wait 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 but what's the name of the show you got to get the show it doesn't right. matter i'm saying star track <laughs> any and anything that offshoots from that <laughs> yes i'm very much a trekkie well that's a point and a half now go ahead dennis <laughs> all right all right well then that makes me put my back hook against the wall and i'm gonna take a hell mary here well hold and- on dennis he gave me a hint lance can you give him a, can you give dennis a hint because i don't want to hear about it later you will too uh kirk or picard there's your hint well it's picard is the show you're currently watching <laughs> there you go but but i'm not even gonna take that i'm not no. gonna, i'm okay. confident in my new guess and i'm gonna say mandalorian i've never watched mandalorian <laughs> lars wins <laughs> that's that's illogical well, so okay. Well, then, so I, I take it that you you watch sports and that you're a football fan. Yeah, I'm a big Chargers fan, actually. Chargers, what's wrong with you, bro? We were getting. We're talking about Herbert's well. one of the best quarterbacks that's ever going to be, man. And you guys just got Khalil too. That oh, I yeah. knew that was going to bite us in the ass. I knew that I'm not. I'm not, and I'm a I'm a Raiders fan. But everything that the, you know, and I've been born and raised a Raiders fan. So, so we I've been, have to talk about that game. Oh, like. Oh. I was at like so when I was young, I was horrible. Like I was the guy throwing the remote at the TV and losing my mind and just just couldn't control my emotions, kid. Now the Chargers are so Chargers. Like now it's just kind of like, well, it happened again. Like there's too much hope, and then it, they just go, no. Um, that game, oh my well, god! Like we the were, most we, inconceivable we were, scenario that could ever possibly happen. And professional sports, it's like, oh, if these two teams tie this game, they'll both go to the playoffs. There's no way that happens, none whatsoever. Well, because the Chargers had just too big of an ego. All you guys had to do is lay down. I know. You had to do. Everybody watched it. Everybody watched it, and then it was kind of like, okay, you took a timeout. We have to run a play. We're going to run the ball. All you got to do is stop us. Oh, you gave up 15 yards. (laughs) <laughs> but we have to like you even say this call was like we, we have to try the field goal we can't just not do it now we're too close not to and then there's that famous clip of uh i can't remember the two players i think it was the raiders center and uh eckler or somebody was like yeah talking and like you, he tells him he's like dude we were gonna take the tie and he's like oh <laughs> god we were like it's like that is insane like in pittsburgh well, listen like, you, you could feel it. I, I, if I could feel it in my living room that we're going to take the tie, I don't know how it, it just went. Right, it, was, it, was, it was the most, char- like, I'm, like, laughing hysterically at the most <laughs> Chargers moment. Of, I love the Chargers. Like, amazingly, they followed me on Twitter, and they used to communicate a little bit. I, I wanted to go to a game at SoFi because that looks like such an amazing stadium. But, man, like, that was, again, it's was, it was the most Chargers moment of the Chargers history and then the most recent history. It's just, like, all you had to do is just not screw up, and they just, screwed up. Yeah, wow. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> all Dave, right. Big, Dave Big Ben is one last playoff game. Yeah, yeah that, that was a tough one. And I'm a Patriots guy, by the way, if anybody cares. <laughs> no, we don't. We nope. don't. No, All right, Lance, where can people find you outside of AEW Dynamite and everything else AEW is doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm, my main socials that I use are my Twitter and my Instagram. I, I, I blog out of Facebook because Facebook was just too toxic. Um, but yeah, I use my Twitter fairly often and then my Instagram and whatnot. Those are the two main socials that I use. And like I said, you know, follow us, keep, keep watching on AEW Dynamite, Rampage, uh, Dark Elevation, Dark 
on uh, YouTube and whatnot. You know, I, I'm there murdering uh, locals on a regular basis. It's lots of fun. I carry them to the ring and destroy them. It's it's fun for me, not them necessarily, but you know. Well, I, I will say this first and foremost, thank you to AEW's PR team for making this happen, making this happen super quick. Uh, Danny, yes. thank you, buddy. Uh, thank you, Fight TV, thank you so much uh, for watching <laughs> out there. Uh, Wrestling Perspective, Lars, you're on tour. Somewhere in these boxes, you'll see his tour dates. Just go see them when the, they're not here now while we're here, but they will be when the people watch. So look for them probably like right in that corner over there. So this corner. Uh, yeah. That corner right there. Just say, Hey, those are my tour dates. <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. Which one? We're like the page now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right there. That's Lars's tour dates. Go see him when he comes uh, to your that. town. There you go, guys. Uh, this was the wrestling <laughs> perspective. Lance Archer, Thank you so much for being genuine with your time. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you guys having me on.